right now, I would say my truth and belief class was a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying integrated studies this semester because integrated studies, you can just combine everything that's interesting to you and make a class out of it, which is great. And I, um, I think it's a lot of fun and the students are very participatory and dynamic and we can just talk about all kinds of things. And um, in integrated studies, I feel like there's no forced curriculum. It's just whatever is fascinating. And I like that a lot. Yeah. And I also have really enjoyed my paradox class and um, animal ethics is a great class too. These are, I'm delighted to be able to teach here. I've been given the opportunity to teach really exciting, fun, and some advanced classes. I'm motivated by the subject, really. I mean, the reason I got into philosophy wasn't like, I decided to be a college teacher, what in? It was more like, I just love philosophy. I love to think about, I love to read about, I love to talk about the most important questions, life's most persistent questions, as Gar Noir would put it. And I, um, so to me, to be in the presence of active, you know, minds, college students who are interested in talking about philosophical questions and applying them to life and society, you know, it doesn't really get much better than that. It's just like having a conversation as your job. Plus, there's, then there's the grading, but nevertheless, as far as class goes, that's what motivates me, is the love of the subject matter and love talk, talking about it with in, intelligent people. I was raised on Bob Dylan, and I took him on on my own even after I left home. And I, I could sing any Dylan song you could probably name and tell you what it means in my own head. Even, even the most obscure ones like Visions of Johanna and it's all right, Ma, I'm only bleeding. To me, those, those lyrics come through like, like, they're, like they're written on my soul from me to you. And uh, so, those, so those, that's, uh, that's a cultural product that has really resonated with me. Folk music that cuts deep. Folk music that means something real. And Dylan's not the only Joni Mitchell. I mean, wow, she makes me melt, you know. Pretty lies, you know. She the, the the way she sings those lines, you just so so. I love I love that kind of um, era of folk music, and there's there's good stuff going on in that genre now. Um, other cultural products. Well, my wife and I like film, and we also like old movies. And one thing I like about old films is is I feel like it's not just a movie. It's a it's a time slice. I'm. I'm feeling my grandparents' generation and a little of the emotions that were, what it was like to be there. And I, I really feel that way that, that life is four dimensional, at least, and not just what exists, but it's what it, what it feels like to exist. And I feel like art is an attempt to express what it feels like to exist, what it's like to be me. And if you can feel some of another time, another era, and just the, the moods and the uh, I really appreciate that, you know. Like Triumph like... of the Will, for example? <laughs> oh, gosh, please, no. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. But uh, from that era, we watched Sunrise, uh, Sunrise, Sunset, or just Sunrise from 1928. Sunrise. It was a it was a silent one, and that was fantastic. Yeah, it's you one know. of my favorites. Yeah. What a great film. So artistic, you know, just the way they rendered it. And it even has, like, a psychedelic scene. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we've been watching all the best picture winners of all time, and we just got, yeah, we we're, we're watching Lawrence of Arabia now. What a mood piece that is. Mm -hmm. It's great. Well, the obvious answer to me is Wittgenstein. And he... Lately, I've been starting to finally, after all these years, after converting to Wittgensteinianism, question whether part of me wants to be an I linguist too. And I, I don't want to feel that you have to choose sides between E and I languages because I really feel they're both essential. But at the time I, quote, converted to Wittgenstein, I experienced it as tremendously liberating. That I felt that my previous self, which could be more, was more influenced by, say, Frege and Tarski, mathematical philosophy, the, the hope that we could reform language so that it was perfect and represented meaning directly so that there wasn't all kinds of um, cultural innuendo or, you know, uh, that it was, it was literal. Everything could be understood. I, I used to have that hope. 
And then when I converted to Wittgensteinianism, I felt like liberated from the chains of so-called logic and awakened to a reality that was, that was living, that meaning is alive. Meaning is not an eternal dead thing. It's a growing, changing, um, beautiful, ugly, manipulable, um, stubborn, it's all the above living thing. And therefore, if meaning is alive, then truth is alive. And we're watching it unfold. Le recently, I saw a Facebook posting that says, we are the 99.9999999% and it was a poster of animals. Meaning that um, there's no more oppressed and not listened to group on this planet than non-humans. I mean, unless you want to count plants too, and you know, but they're non-human as well. The, the, the animals, the plants, the earth, there's no more abused and neglected group than the animals. And they are completely ignored, and yet, at the same time, completely confined, completely mistreated, and then completely killed just because we like the way they taste. So if you want to talk about liberation movements or, or equality or justice or any of these things that I intensely believe in, um, what about the animals? The, um, I feel that people generally don't want to talk about animals because they like, they'd rather eat them, right? And they, they, if they're exposed to the abuse of animals by watching video or something, they're horrified. If they see how animals are raised on factory farms today, any feeling person is disturbed and generally speaking horrified by the conditions that our animals are raised in. But that doesn't translate into a change in behavior for most people for one reason or another. And so as an, as an animal ethicist, um, one of my goals is to make sure that people actually think this through, that they say, wait a minute, let's see what the treatment is and let's see if we can justify it. And if we can't justify it, then it would seem to follow that we ought to change. And if we don't want to change, then we seek to justify it. So I, I want to make sure that that conversation happens. You know, usually um, a person sees those videos, it doesn't take a lot of convincing, but I want, I want people to not get away with what I call ignorance. Ignorance is ignorance and you don't want the truth. You're just ignorant. You know, I want to make sure that people see the truth and then have to discuss it. And that is one of the things, one of the, one of the charms of philosophy in general is that we don't just let people get away with their assumptions. We expect people to ask, that we expect people to justify, we expect people to reason and be able to articulate their reasons. And so I feel when it comes to this, particular issue. My philosophical penchant unites with my personal moral passion that animals are strongly mistreated and that our society deserves, that they deserve better and that we owe it. Ethics requires that we treat them better. So bring those two together and you get an interesting class and an interesting discussion. So yeah, I advocate for animals and I think that by doing so I'm also doing philosophy.